uh, if this week we're doing a whole series on uh, the U.S. budget and uh, where we are and where we're going uh, from a budget standpoint. Yesterday we talked about the Glorious Revolution in Great Britain in 1688. We went all the ba way back to the 1300s, actually, and we talked about how in 1688, uh, you had new leadership in Great Britain that allowed the debt to be more freely uh, taken as collateral. And so you saw debt to GDP go from 5% to over 200% uh, of the economy over the next 100 years. Uh, then in the early 1800s, with the conclusion of the Napoleonic Wars and the advent of Industrial Revolution, you actually saw that debt to GDP ratio fall again and into a much more sustainable 30 to 40 percent range over the ensuing 40 to 50 years. And so what we're doing this week is we're really charting uh, how that might look for the United States. So yesterday, Again, we looked at the debt, interest rates, and inflation in totality going back all the way to the 1300s, uh, looking through Florence, the Medici's, uh, and, and even into the United States, uh, more nearer term. Uh, today, we're going to really dive into what the United States looks like right now uh, from a budget standpoint, from a balance sheet standpoint, and also we want to look at who holds the debt. Because we've received, especially over the last few days, a number of questions from clients and other people about, well, what would happen if China defaulted uh, or China, excuse me, did not uh, buy U.S. government debt or more, more uh, or even worse than that? What if they sold U.S. government debt? What would that mean to our status as the reserve currency? And we'll talk a little bit. We'll talk a much more about that on Thursday. We'll have a special uh, morning presentation on that, on just the reserve currency status. But today we'll talk a little bit about who holds the debt, and you'll probably be able to uh, discern a little bit more uh, about uh, what what that might entail. So uh, with that, we're going to jump in and talk about the budget. And it all starts uh, with this chart. How did we get here? In 2003, um, the uh, the orange line is the government debt. The green line is our deficit. So you want the green line going up, going towards surplus, and you want the orange line going down. But we have the opposite. Federal debt has gone from about six trillion dollars in 2003 uh, to 30 trillion dollars today, and is projected to go to more than 50 trillion dollars in 2033, just 10 years from now. Meanwhile, the deficit isn't getting any better. The deficit was, you know, almost balanced in 2003. It got a little bit worse by 2013. Today, we're talking more than trillion dollar deficits. So every year, spending more than a trillion dollars. And by 2033, we're talking about a $1.4 trillion plus deficit, which means if you uh, were to make, you know, $20 trillion, you're spending $21.4 trillion every year. So that that's what the numbers look like. Um, and uh, we'll get into a little bit more details right now. But basically, the debt is not in a good situation, and it's not getting any better. In fact, it's getting worse. So let's look at why this is happening. So let's look at the expenses. And what we did here is we actually looked at expenses um, on a line by line item going back all the way to 2003 and then projecting out to 2033. And a lot of these uh, expenses have been uh, broadly consistent in terms of uh, rate of growth. What we can see is that overall total expenses are up 5% uh, every single year. Um, and Again, this is an economy that maybe has a potential of GDP of three and a half to four and a half percent on a normalized basis. So five percent means the government is growing disproportionately relative to the rest of the economy, which, of course, as we know, is not sustainable. But what we realize if we dig a little further here is that defense spending, yes, it's a lot. It's not the problem. It's actually growing a little bit slower than nominal GDP. Non-defense discretionary is growing, which is uh, uh, is growing slower than 
nominal GDP. And I was going to break this non-defense discretionary out, but there are 300 line items, even if you sort by department. So um, I do have that data if anyone's interested, but the big line items can it consist of things like NASA, $25 billion, um, things like that. Um, and, and so this is where it adds up to that 935 today, and then $1.2 trillion going into 2033. Um, so the big issues here uh, are social security and major healthcare. Social security, I'm not as concerned about because um, one, if you increase the retirement age by one year, you reduce the uh, expense by 7%. So it, it, you, can, you can figure out social security, but what I'm much more concerned about is major healthcare programs. And the big problem here is Medicare. This is growing much too fast. And the problem is, Back in 2003, major health care was just another line item, kind of on par with defense and non-defense. But by 2033, it will be triple the spending on defense. Um, and 7% is just not a sustain. We cannot carry a 7% uh, in perpetuity in terms of increases in major health care. So we have to figure out ways to get uh, uh, Medicare spending. And we don't even have to cut Medicare spending. If we increase it by four and a half percent, we can dramatically, dramatically reduce um, the rate of growth. And so over time, the economy will grow a little bit faster than healthcare spending and we'll be okay. Um, but 7% is not sustainable. And as it becomes a larger and larger portion, it will dominate that overall expense category, meaning this 5% will continue to tick higher as it over indexes to this ma these major healthcare programs. So we need to get that figured out. And, and we should have got it figured out yesterday, um, but there is some hope. And we'll talk about solutions to all of these problems uh, uh, tomorrow. But the big takeaway here is that it's not really non-defense discretionary. Everyone loves, loves to talk, talk about the $100 hammer uh, for defense, but it's not really defense spending. It's not really even Social Security, but it is is it is major healthcare programs that are really causing some some issues for us. Um, so this looks at our revenue, which is basically all your tax revenue and and excise taxes and tariffs and things like that, and it compares it to those expenses that we just talked about. So uh, again, you can see growth rates, and so our revenue has grown and is expected to grow at about 4.7%. So if you look at 4.7% growth and compare it to 5% growth, there's not a big difference in that. Um, and so you'd love to think that, and, and if you were to increase the rate of growth of revenue, so it, it exceeds expenses, then over time, you should ultimately balance the budget. It may, may take a while because you'll have to catch up. But over time, you should make the progress. Again, you have the issue with major healthcare, um, but this is how it breaks out. And within income taxes, you have just kind of your normal income taxes, and you also have your capital gains taxes, and the same with corporate income taxes. So I think what's notable here is um, how little the corporate income tax actually plays a role in raising revenue. If you were to double corporate income taxes, for example, um, that's not even closing the deficit by a third. So, you know, there there are there are a number of ways to solve these issues, but corporate taxes and frankly even capital gains taxes in isolation are probably not the solution to balance the budget. You need overall revenue growth. And you can increase maybe GDP, um, and you need expense cuts, and and really that major healthcare is a glaring line item that uh, you'd really like to see solved. But at the conclusion, you can see the budget deficit has gone from 201 billion dollars a year, and this is again a year we're losing 201 billion dollars um, to one trillion dollars today, and then uh, projected out at 1.5 trillion dollars in 2033. And again, as we talked about, Medicare is much too large and it's growing much too fast. Um, the good news is, um, even with these projections, which admittedly are not, not very cheery projections, because we do have a robust economy and, and the CBO projections for GDP growth are not excessive. They're 1.7, 1.8%. 1 
And even so, we should get some leveling off of the debt to GDP ratio over the next 10 years. And, and bear in mind, today, Japan has a debt to GDP ratio over 200%. And then in the, um, in the 1800s, the Great Britain had a debt to GDP ratio of 240%, and they were able to solve it. And they were able to solve it um, because they significantly increased their economic growth over the next 40 years due to industrial revolution. So although debt continues to go up, it is positive that um, uh, this green line is beginning to uh, flatten out a little bit. Another positive is the fact that our tax burden remains less than 20%. Uh, so if you actually look at the budget gap as a percentage of GDP, so obviously revenue does not equal GDP. Revenue is only a portion of GDP because we don't take 100% away in taxes. We take about 18% in taxes, um, but we spend 22%. So, you know, from a, from a pure math perspective, the economy is big enough to support this expense burden, but it would, would require a significant increase in income tax rates and, and corporate income tax rates. Um, so that's how you end up, uh, that's how a lot of people want to bridge that gap. Frankly, I think it could probably brid be bridged other ways, but again, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. So the point here is that although the debt is bigger than the GDP, in order to balance that budget on an annual basis, we're actually only 4% of GDP away um, from, from doing that. It's big numbers, but on a percentage basis, it's, it's not insurmountable. Uh, I did look at the Social Security Trust Fund because I know there are a lot of questions about that. The, in 2023, uh, today, the uh, trust fund's at about $5.9 trillion. Uh, in, 2020, in 2033, it's expected to be $4.5 trillion. So again, um, it's not trending in the right direction, but there are workable solutions that should be relatively palatable that that would allow us to put that in a in a better spot. You could, and and we'll, again, we'll talk about those tomorrow. I don't want to put the cart before the horse. And then finally, um, if we look at who o owns U.S. debt, who does the U.S. government owe owe money to, and. 75% is U.S. domiciled. Five trillion is at the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve itself. Seven trillion is in intra-government accounts, and 11 trillion is held by domestic investors like pensions, mutual funds, insurance companies. Only 870 billion dollars is held by China. Um, so, of the 32 trillion dollars in debt, uh, less than three percent of that is held by China. So, I think that's a that's a key statistic that I think is often glossed over when they say China could cause the U.S. Minsky moment. Um, if you look at these holders, the lion's share of the holders are not China. So uh, to summarize what we've talked about today, the U.S. does have a lot of debt and spending has outpaced economic growth. Uh, what is notable is that discretionary spending, which includes defense and non-defense -dis discretionary, it has grown slower than the overall economy over the last 20 years. But Medicare entitlements are a growing share of the budget, and they're growing much faster. Uh, right now, uh, as we looked at in terms of a percentage of GDP, there's actually plenty of capacity in the economy to cover our obligations. Um, but we do need to do something about Medicare now, and we probably need to do something about Social Security in the future. Um, and frankly, and we'll talk more about this on Thursday, uh, but we aren't overly concerned about foreign boycotts of U.S. debt and uh, threats there. So uh, Medicare is the big takeaway here. Um, and the fact that, you know, we, we can solve this. Um, there are potential solutions. Uh, again, if you want these slides, I can send them to you. Um, but with that, we will leave that there and uh, have a great day. And we'll see you tomorrow with our solutions.